Hey everybody, happy Friday. Uh, I'm Robert Douglas and this is Deploy Friday, the webcast that celebrates those brave developers who have enough confidence in their code and their infrastructure to push their code into production on Fridays with no fear that you are ruining your weekend or somebody else's weekend because you trust the systems that you're using. Um, today, we have a fantastic show uh, entitled Reducing Online Risk with the UK Cybersecurity Association. And with me today to talk about these things, although I see one of our guests has just made a, a hasty exit. <laughs> Welcome back, Lisa. Uh, we have Lisa Ventura, who's actually the founder of the uh, UK Cybersecurity Association, and Chris Windley, who I understand is the um, chief operating officer of that association. So before we um, before we get into it, this is the second uh, episode kind of in a series about cybersecurity. Uh, my goal in shining this light on cybersecurity is that everybody understands what the risks actually are in the world and what is being done about them and how to frame your thinking uh, when assessing risks and looking for solutions in that space. With that said, I would like to turn it over to our guests, to my guests, to introduce themselves. So welcome, Lisa. Welcome, Chris. Lisa, let's start with you. Uh, who are you? Where are you? What do you do? And um, we're going to get to the question about your organization later, about why you founded it, but um, at least tell us when you founded it. Hi, um, so I'm Lisa. I'm the co-director and founder of the UK Cybersecurity Association, and I've been within the cybersecurity industry since 2009. Um, and I also do a lot of work to champion women in cyber equality and diversity and skills um, training and education. Um, those topics uh, within the industry are very close to, to my heart. Um, and I also do a lot of work around the current you know, threat landscape and looking at what's um, going on, what the trends are, the rise in phishing, ransomware, which has been huge this year. Um, so that's me. And when did you found your association? Yes. Uh, we opened our doors for membership just a couple of months ago, but it's actually been in the making for a number of years. Um, so I actually first had the idea for it as far back as 2012, um, but I've been involved in lots of other work and projects and also um, doubling up, which I still do um, today as a carer for my father who's been in ill health. So um, time's been at a premium to, uh, to focus on it. But I first registered all the social media channels and got the website up and running around 2014, 2015, um, registered the company for it in 2019 and officially opened a couple of months ago. Amazing. And we're going to learn all about what your mission is and what you do. But let's meet Chris first. Chris, who are you? Where are you? What do you do? And uh, what's your connection to cybersecurity? Uh, yep. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Chris Windley. So uh, uh, actually, I'm the um, co-director and head of business development. Uh, okay. Here I, 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 I almost got it right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, Not it, quite. it's fine. You know, you know just, just, just to be accurate, <laughs> if you're like, yeah. So uh, that's that. That's what I do. Um, and so, like Whistle Stop Tour, uh, I'm an ex-Navy weapons engineer officer. So. Uh, back then, you know, um, fighting on the internet was basically electronic warfare, you know, over radio waves. That's the, that's what we used to do back then. Um, a career in information technology. Then I went um, about five years ago into a thing that we have over here called the GCHQ NCSC Cyber Accelerator. Um, that's, a, that's a place that we have over here for um helping accelerate and scale up um cyber security um companies in the uk uh and uh, also spent a couple of years with the police um that was when i met lisa during 2019 um in your role as, the, and, as a police officer no no not as a police officer uh, i no uh well for you for your interest um we, what we were doing, we were rolling out um, things here that they call cyber resilience centres uh, across the UK, right? Which are, this is not an accurate description, but it helps, I, speak, I think, form an idea in your mind. It's sort of like 
999 for cyber attack and uh, there's one of those in every police region in the UK um, so Lisa and I met with that I got her involved with the West Midlands Cyber Resilience Centre actually and we both sit on the advisory board for that um, and uh, then you know uh, then we started a thing called Cybersecurity Valley together and then the UK Cybersecurity Association, and that pretty well brings us up to date. Fantastic. <laughs> that what, a, long. <laughs> what a whisk-up tour. Thank you for that. So yeah. I want to get right into um, threat. S security is a response to threat. When threat is present, you are unsecure, you feel insecure, uh, and there's danger. Threat is equivalent to danger. And the process of focusing on security is mitigating, removing, alleviating threat. But understanding the threat when it comes to information technology is terribly difficult. Uh, I can attest from a programmer's point of view when programming, programming web applications. For example, in, in, in my training, in my history, that um, thinking about security, it's always presented almost as that extra thing that is kind of like you have to do these extra steps to make it secure. You can't just go straight to your goal. You can't just send the information that you want to send. The, the as, It's not that easy. You've got to do these extra things. It's kind of that's how it's presented, uh, at least it was for me, uh, and, and, and that's maybe not the right way. But that's not even the full portrayal of the threat uh, as, as I understand it now when, when you talk about cybersecurity. So maybe, maybe Chris, I'm going to ask you to start. <laughs> I want to I know what the threat is. What are, and there are multiple threats, but uh, I mean, are people still attacking electronic networks with electricity, like you said, or um, <laughs> is, is it something else these days? Well, it, you know, it is all done over the internet these days. So it's all done, you know, over an IP network pretty well these days. Um, you know, there, there are some uh, people that are like, you know, hacking um, wirelessly into things as well. But it's pretty well, you know, all done over the internet. And uh, it is a, you know, really serious problem. You know, it's, it's difficult to know, isn't it? It's a really serious problem. Yeah, well, so I think last year I went to a, uh, a seminar and uh, they were talking at the time about it being, some people saying, oh, it's about a trillion, something like that, that we're losing, Right. But there was a guy that was presenting from AXA and uh, he'd done a lot of research in this. And he said, it's at least seven trillion globally. A AXA, like, the insurer. Yes. Part, uh, okay, he so was, they really know. I mean, and the insurers are paid to uh, assess risk and protect against it. OK, so this guy, seven trillion this guy, globally. Yeah, seven trillion. And that was that was really last year that he was saying that right and and just to back up what you said there robert um he was a specialist uh he you know the, he ha he was in a company that was part of axa uh and he was a specialist cyber insurance analyst um and um so he knew what he was talking about and the big problem here robert is that most of cyber crime goes unreported right so Whatever number it, you actually know about, it's the tip of the iceberg, right? Because there's a whole lot of stuff that's gone on that you don't know about, you know. And and actually, it was funny. When I got into cybersecurity and I used to go to um, networking organizations, um, before I was in cybersecurity, nobody talked to me about cybersecurity. But when I got into cybersecurity, people would, like, take me off into a dark corner you know, and say, oh, Chris, you know, we've been hit. And by the way, this was usually like a law firm or an accountancy firm or or something like that. We've been hit again. And I went, again? <laughs> they went, yeah. You know, and I said, did you report it? Oh, no, we couldn't do that, Chris. <laughs> that would damage our reputation. <laughs> so let me ask then, if we're talking, you've, you've put a face on it a little bit there, law firm, accountant firm, Who who's losing the seven trillion and to whom are they losing it? 
Lisa, you want to take that one? Or Chris? Okay, okay Lisa. So she, she probably didn't hear that then. Well, obviously it's across the board. Hopefully, Lisa, we haven't lost Lisa there, but hopefully it's across the board. Uh, sorry, it is across the board, uh, Robert. You know, I mean, as we have seen, what you know, one of the biggest um, misconceptions at the minute is that a lot of people uh, think, oh, it won't be me. They won't be after me, right? You know, so that's like, that's particularly the cry of the small business, right? Um, you know, it won't, it, it, won't, it won't be me they're after. They're after bigger companies than me, right? But, you know, what they're not realizing is that, you know, we're talking about bots here. You know, it, this is automation. They've got, you know, automation running. That's basically looking for a gap. Um, and when they find that gap, then they exploit it, right? So, yes, there are some people that want to target certain things. But, it, you know, in the main, it's actually random. Uh, okay. That helps. That helps a lot. So, Lisa, you probably want to jump in on that since um, you've now overcome, hopefully, the, the, the incredible technical difficulties presented by these I weird can... things we wear in our ears. <laughs> I can hear you now. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, I mean, I, I can come in from I'm, I've just seen some um, new stats today around the rise of, um, of, of, of phishing. Um, so in the NCSE's weekly threat report, apparently, um, phishing scams, particularly those pertaining to HMRC in the UK, have grown by 87% during COVID. And that's just an incredible number. So that's just, and that's just one element, you know, one threat. And then, of course, there's ransomware and insider threats and, you know, all sorts of, 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 of data breaches, um, CEO fraud, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's just so much. Um, and I think a lot of businesses just don't know where to start um, in terms of securing their systems and um, getting things in place to try to uh, mitigate against um, cyber attacks. And that's um, where a lot of the work that we do within the um, UK Cybersecurity Association comes in, particularly for small businesses and SMEs that haven't um, felt that well supported from a cybersecurity perspective, particularly here in the UK, but also, um, I'm still seeing, despite COVID and despite all the extra threats that have come as a result from that and the big move to working from, from home quickly, I'm still seeing a lot of um, the smaller businesses and SMEs think, well, it's not going to affect us. We're too small. And because we're too small, no hacker's going to touch us. We're OK until they get um, hit by a data breach or a cyber attack. And then it's it's too late. Um, so you're yeah, certainly seeing a, a, a lot of that. And that is where a lot of the work um, comes in that we do. So walk me through an attack. Um, I'm still, it, it, thank you for all those answers. And that helps a little bit. It sounds like everybody's at danger, probably individuals as well as businesses and the individuals within businesses, governments as well. Um, are in fact no different than businesses and they're also comprised of individuals so governments also probably at risk but what does uh, you know walk me through maybe an example of two or three of those types of attacks you said phishing ransomware and ceo fraud right um talk, talk me through those just from sure. from end to end from yeah. from from who's the black hat here is that you chris <laughs> So Chris, Chris, Chris is going to. But Chris is going Lisa to go because, she, because you know she's got a good handle on this. Uh, these different types of attacks. Okay. And that. Mm. Yeah. So phishing is where a hacker will try to ask to, to, to cover a, get a company um, and get their emails to look exactly like them and send those out en masse in the hope that somebody will click on one of the links within. Um, and that will then take them to somewhere malicious whereby they can open up a back door um, into their systems and thereby a, a, a data breach or pertinent information can be obtained um, by, by hackers or criminals. Um, the emails are getting so, so sophisticated um, today. It's, it's unbelievable. They have the same look, the same logo, the same feel, 
same information, but some of the key the key differences is look for the grammar and the way that the um, email is worded and spelling. Um, often they'll have um, grammatical errors or spelling errors, etc., which is a giveaway. And also by just hovering the mouse over the links in these emails, you'll then be able to see that they they're actually links um, to somewhere completely different other than where the email is pertaining um, to be from. Um, classic example, I actually had one pertaining to be from the UK's um, TV licensing um, people and it came just at a point where I knew my TV license was due to be renewed literally a couple of weeks or so before and it's it said you need to set up your direct debit etc and even I for that split split second I had to think oh is this real because it looked so sophisticated and they are getting a lot lot more um, sophisticated um, so that's an example of um, of, of, the fish, of phishing um, Chris do you want to take ransomware and I'll come back to CEO fraud uh, well yeah I might I've got something in my mind that I was just going to um, say to you actually you know I mean mm. It was, I think, it was about two years ago uh, that the chief technical officer of the National Cyber Security Centre uh, published a blog about how he'd nearly been caught himself, <laughs> right? And um, and that and that was because um, he got. Uh, if you've ever seen this one, I don't know what the name is it for it, Lisa, but you know the one where that you get an email from your boss or something, right? And he basically says, oh, God, can you, um, I've forgotten to do the shopping. Can you just pop out and do X, Y, and Z, right? But, you know, and of course, because it comes from your boss, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, boss. <laughs> you know, you forget to look at it. And uh, he was nearly caught on that um, himself. And, you know, he published a blog about it, so I'm allowed to say it. Right? So, but then... Um, but I think the other the other thing just to mention, Robert, uh, and maybe Lisa will cover uh, a bit more on ransomware if you don't mind. But but is that um, is that you know what we call the attack surface has changed dramatically, right? We used to talk about um, trying to protect six million SMEs in the UK. Um, well, 6 million SMEs in the UK became 25 million people working from home, like, uh, you know, as we still are doing now, right? And all of us that are working from home can imagine, you know, our scenarios. It's, and, and the thing is, it's not rocket science, is it? We've all got a broadband coming into our home. We've all got a router. Uh, with Wi-Fi, probably, right? And we've all got a device attached to that router, right? Not really rocket science, right? The, I mean, the other thing that any hacker would know straight away is that probably the router is still in default configuration. In other words, the password hasn't been changed on it from the manufacturer default setting. Right. Everybody panics now at this point, right? <laughs> Trying to think whether or not they've actually changed the configuration on their um, on their router. So, well, you know, not, but not, not even to mention that, you know, maybe a, a pure password protection on a device that's always on and always there and never touched is probably not very much protection at all. You can brute force that at a snail's pace and still get in. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we we can, if you want to, go down the password route, but, you know, yeah, you know, uh, that's right. You know, every, everybody still names it after their cat or their dog, don't they? Anyway, even if they changed it from the default configuration, yeah. So I don't know that I went off at a bit, a bit of a tangent there, but it's very, it's very important to understand this, but, you know, and Lisa actually talks about, um, again, I, you know, I won't really do it, but talks about the point where we all go back into the office, right? But, you know, if I deal with the bit, if you like, where we all went out of the office and worked from home, right, we are all extremely vulnerable um, and the supply chains are extremely vulnerable, you know, because of that complete change in, in as I say, what we call the attack surface really has, has completely changed 
globally you know so uh i don't know whether that's a point for you to come in there lisa with uh if you want to go totally helpful let's come back though to the ransomware example so yeah. we've got a contrast to the phishing yeah so with with ransomware it tends to be more of a form of malware that will encrypt um somebody's files um and then a hacker or attacker will demand a ransom from the victim to restore um access to data um, upon receiving uh, some sort, sort of payment um, and often many users will be given instructions for how to pay um, a fee to get a decryption key to unlock their systems and the cost can range from a few hundred dollars to thousands and it's often demanded um, to cyber criminals in things like Bitcoin um, and I don't know if you recall the uh, Wanna Cry um, cyber attack that went um, around the world. Um, that was a ransomware attack that originated um, on some older NHS systems um, in the UK. Um, so it is a, a massive, massive problem and more organizations than ever are being um, targeted in this way. Um, just recently, we've had Colonial Pipeline, for example, and lots of um, you know, other, other bigger ones. And they actually have the potential to disrupt systems um, enough that if they were um, as Colonial Pipeline part of the um, critical national infrastructure, they can cause significant disruption with those um, systems being down. Um, there's, there's insurance that you can get against this, but there's a lot of talk within the industry about um, whether uh, pe whether people affected should actually pay the, the, the ransoms and whether insurance um, should even cover um, those ransoms and what happens. So it's it's really a big um, talking point within the um, the industry at the moment. And I think, Chris, I think you actually alluded to CEO fraud where somebody, mm -hmm. um, if I understand, Lisa, what you were going yeah. to go for with that, where somebody spoofs being somebody, yeah. it's more general than that. CEO is easy, but it can be anybody. It can be your best yeah. friend, it can be your yeah. spouse, it could be your children, you know, hey, dad, right? It, it comes in, it's a form of social engineering, and it comes in uh, under the pretense of being somebody you know, asking for something plausible in that context that involves something that is not good for you, yeah. like sending money. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was just going to say, Lisa, I was just going to say, that, so Robert, we're, um, uh, we're working at the minute on, I, I don't know whether you know, but we're working on cyber documentaries with ITN and BBC. Um, and the, the ITN one uh, launches in September, right? Um, but here was a funny thing, right, was I, I'll, I, to protect the innocent, I will just change things slightly here, yeah, right, right. But there was a person, you know, that we did used to hear an awful lot from um, on the production team, right. Um, and then uh, one weekend, uh, Lisa and I got this, like, panic email. I need to speak to you. I need to speak to you. We were, like okay it's like you know the weekend or whatever you know what is what is going on now well what was going on was um he was selling his house and buying another house right um and um he got basically an, an email which purported to be from his solicitor uh basically saying uh transfer the ten thousand pound deposit now Right, and uh, uh, which you know, I and I, I think he would admit that had he not been working on a cyber security documentary with us, he probably would have been caught, you know, because they got him at exactly the right time, right? With so exactly let's, the right let's, thing. let's pull that apart a bit because this is this is actually um, one of the things that interests me very much about the whole field. So. With, in both Lisa's case and this case, whether it was coincidental in Lisa's case or not, the timing was so precise that it's almost spooky, almost like somebody knows something more than they should. We could, you know, as a skeptic, as a cynic, we could think maybe uh, the organization that, um, you know, sends out Lisa's uh, um, uh television or radio bill or whatever that was maybe they're leaking data somehow maybe somebody was actually able to for example come upon renewal dates and knew exactly when to send that it's not implausible 
and, and maybe, you know, in this case, um, somebody clearly knew that this, you know, some of the solicitor had been probably hacked. That's the only plausible explanation in that second case is that the solicitor was leaking information somehow so that the people knew their client list to target. That's the well, only they, way that they could have known. In that, in, in that case, Robert, we're pretty sure that they were already in the network and they were monitoring all the emails, right? So they'd, they'd already hacked into the email system. They were, they were literally watching all the emails go backwards and forwards. Um, and, then, and that is how, you know, they sent an email at exactly the right time saying exactly the right thing, right? And, you know, this so my, is again... My, my point here was, yeah. is, sorry to interrupt, but I think this is a really important point, is that the, the, the visible security incident that you mentioned, Chris, and possibly also in your case, Lisa, was not actually the original security breach to begin with. There was already a breach that led to the second breach. And I think uh, from what I've understood about reading about other attacks, it's often a succession of breaking a perimeter and then moving beyond that and breaking another perimeter and moving beyond that, which is, you know, why it's very interesting that you mentioned the home routers, and I understand that actually, uh, percentage-wise, a huge number of home wireless routers are in fact hacked, which means that ostensibly a, a sophisticated attacker could know on any of those routers pretty much everything they would need to about the, the traffic going in and out of that. They would know, for example, who's looking at what websites at what time of day, um, some of the texts possibly emails might be going in and out unencrypted altogether. They could just read them in plain text. So it's, it's pretty terrifying. So one thing that I've, I'm still trying to understand though, is the, is the we, we've, we've talked a lot about the human attack surface, the social engineering aspect, you know, the social engineering of, um, you know, getting an email that looks uh, credible, but having a link that's malicious or having uh, also, again, an email makes me think email should just go away <laughs> and that we'd be better off for it. I've had that thought before. Uh, also an email where the person's impersonating a, a boss or a friend or a CEO or something and, 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 and all of that and the human and the other end takes an action. So, uh, and, and in ransomware, if, if something encrypts your computer, and your hard drive, it's very unlikely that it's because you just clicked a link or visited a web page or something, browsers protect you against that mostly as much as best they can. Probably you had to at the operating system layer say yes, install this thing, right? And, and I, I think that like uh, I've heard of people installing malware as a free download to watch movies or in, as a way to get access for a game or some other incentive where then it Trojan horses on into your system. Um, piggybacking some other legitimate sounding program. So my, where I'm leading with this, by the way, is do we solve this problem by eliminating the human weakness or is a lot of the actual problem all more automated? Because like, you know, you mentioned bots, uh, Chris, who are scanning, doing port scans, sending requests to web servers, probing for weaknesses, testing all the different protocols with different packets that might break things, uh, known exploits on old router configurations, et cetera, et cetera. Where do we fix this the best? In, 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 in like hardening our infrastructure from automated attacks or teaching the people not to click the wrong links? I'd like to come in on that because I do a lot with cybersecurity awareness training um, and the whole social engineering piece. And I think it's a combination of both um, but the, the training of your teams and your people to be able to spot those links is absolutely paramount, I think. And I've done a lot in terms of um, training to, you know, to, to recognize those, those email links, et cetera, which has been proved to, to, to work. Um, there was a bit of a scandal recently where West Midlands um, Railway did a phishing email simulation um, around, and this might be an unpopular opinion of what I'm about to say, but they did a phishing email simulation saying, um, to their staff, 
you're, you, you've been given a bonus, congratulations, click here to register for it. And there was uproar in the press about how awful it was that they did that phishing email simulation at this time during COVID when you know, people are worried about you know, their, their, their finances, might be worried about their jobs, et cetera, and giving them that thing that, oh, we, we're getting a bonus and doing it in that way was, was wrong. But I have a slightly unpopular view here where the attackers don't care about anything like that. So I think it was a good thing to do a phishing email simulation of, of, of that type to really you know, to, to teach their staff if it's too good too good to be true, it usually you know it absolutely is. Um, and I know a lot of um, people within the infosec industry were were saying how wrong it was um, for them to do that. But attackers just don't care. Um, they're going to go for any way possible to get that information to get into those into those systems. Um, so yeah, it might be a, a slightly unpopular opinion, but I think that type of phishing email simulation was was right to do. Excellent. Okay, so hopefully we've spent some time uh, establishing the types of threats and the mm -hmm. level of threat and the value of the assets being attacked. Seven trillion, according to the insurers. What is the UK Cybersecurity Association doing about it? So we exist through our membership um, to to do several things. Um, our objectives is to really raise the awareness of the growing cyber threat and what to do and um, provide as much help um, and information as possible um, around um, all those different threats. Um, but also we exist to try to um, inspire the next generation to consider careers in cybersecurity because um, there's a, a, a huge um, cyber skills gap, for example. Um, so we're always you know, looking to, to bring as many different people from diverse backgrounds um, and the younger generation into careers in cyber. So those are our um, two main um, objectives. Um, and through our membership and our different working groups that all our members are involved in, um, those are the, um, the, the, the main areas um, that, that we're focused um, on. We have a focus as well on supporting, as I said earlier, those small businesses and SMEs that have traditionally felt um, that they've not been um, as well supported or had as much information out there. Um, and also, one of our big projects is to try and demystify the language and the jargon and all of that that's out there. Um, that's, that's a common thing that we've heard is that um, a lot of what is out there and the information that's out there is full of acronyms, you know, DDoS this and so on. And that really confuses um, a lot of uh, people, especially in those smaller businesses. And thus they switch off from it. And thus they think we don't need to bother with it. We're not going to get hit or we don't understand the information. Um, so I'm, I'm sure Chris will go to add to this as well. But that's certainly something that we're going to be looking at doing is we're not sure what the message is yet. We're still working on that message. And as I said, we are quite, quite new, um, but it's certainly um, something that we want to, to focus on um, in the coming months. Yeah, just to pick up on that, really. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what, what we talk about a lot here is um, the messaging is not working to, no. you know, the SME and the home worker, right? That you know that, and that's a global issue, right? So, what you know, whatever is being said at the minute, it isn't working, right? Because you know, say for you know, uh, an example that I use is in the UK, we have the cyber essentials standard, and out of six million SMEs, there are probably thirty or forty thousand that have gone through cyber essentials, right? Um, so unfortunately, you know, it's a it's an absolute drop in the ocean. Um, and, and so we've got to do something really different um, in order to, uh, you know, as I say, actually get people to take action here. Right. Um, and that we don't we don't know exactly what that is. But one, one of the things that we've sort of decided to do, Lisa and I and some other people is to experiment with a few things right because at the minute right the the sum the sum total of the options is scare the shit out of everybody by saying something right uh that's option number one 
option number two is like go into like caregiver mode if you like and try basically talking to people nicely and educating them and trying to help them and unfortunately none of, neither of those work <laughs> or have worked yet um there's a point i want to make just to go back a bit you know and uh you know depend on how much time we've got you know what everybody needs to understand is if you're earning seven trillion pounds or dollars right that's an awful lot of money you've got to spend on perfecting your art right now that does that does lead to a point you know which is being massively debated at the minute you know which is basically simply put well cut off the seven trillion then they won't have any money to spend will they but who are who who are they who who's attacking well they that well, okay, yeah. Who, who are they? Where, where is the money going to, if you like? Uh, I mean, essentially, it's going to individuals and organised crime, you know? Um, is it going to governments? Yeah. I mean, I guess some may be government-sponsored, right? But it's basically going to, I would say, organised crime. I don't know what you would say, Lisa, on that. Uh, you're on mute, Lisa. I'm sorry, I muted you. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Can't unmute now. Maybe you'll have to unmute. I can also Robert. unmute you. Ah, he who, they are. Who, he who taketh away can give it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Chris. I think a lot of it is going um, with organized um, crime, etc. And I think there's a lot more that needs to be um to be done around it and especially as well around the ransomware and you know payments and insurance um i know kira martin who's the ex-ceo of the ncsc is very vocal about um not fun not not paying the ransoms because it's funding terrorism etc but then when you're literally held to ransom with all your files and everything encrypted as a small business and you want to get up and running very quickly what do you do it's a it's very much a catch-22 situation and i don't think the answer's sort of there yet as to whether you should pay, shouldn't pay, whether insurance will cover it. Um, it's There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. Hmm. OK, so let's go back to the UK um, Cybersecurity hmm. Association. Um, I understood that you've got working groups based uh, on different topics and that your member supported, uh, both individuals and uh, companies of, of different sizes can, can join. I, I got that hmm. from your website. Um, what's the what's the working rhythm what's the what's the actual you know um what what do i do as a member you know what's my participation level uh is it mostly broadcast like you're giving me materials uh am i attending seminars am i talking to other peers what what's it like for me once i'm in yeah um, once you once you join to be a member, it's very much um, around that. So we have, for example, our first one day summit event next week, where all our members can meet, interact, um, talk about the latest um, threat developments, what's going on in the cybersecurity space, etc. We've also got a lot of talks around um, cybersecurity from a global perspective and the scourge of, of ransomware are the two key themes. Um, we also have a program of networking events, um, all virtual due to COVID um, at the moment. Um, what our working groups uh, where all our different project work uh, will take place that's shaped um, but from feedback um, from our members um, who are involved in um, four key areas at the, at the moment. Um, so we have a working group for women in cyber, um, for equality and diversity, for skills training and education, and uh, Chris heads up our military and veterans group. Um, but we're also looking at launching a group for CISOs. Um, and Chris can talk a little bit more about that. CISO. And CISO, Chief Information Security Officers. Ah, um, uh, yes, those. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and we're also looking at launching one um, in the legal space um, as as well. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to come in with how the CISO group came about because um, it's quite an interesting story. Well, <laughs> well, yes. Now that we know what a uh, CISO is. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to be a CISO at the minute, yeah. right? <laughs> because you're probably not getting a lot, a lot of sleep, right? Because, you know, you 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 could be attacked any minute um, and uh, you may not be able to persuade your 
bosses and your company that they need to spend a little bit more <laughs> on cyber security, which would make you even more nervous. Um, and, um, and actually, the reality is that um, CISOs jump around a lot at the minute. And I don't think there's any mistake in why they jump around, right? Because it's a bit of a Russian roulette game at the minute. You know, you don't really want to be, um, or is it that bomb game, whatever that's called? You know, you don't want to be holding the bomb, if you like, at the at, when it all goes off. Yeah. Uh, so um, and so we had um, when when we opened, we had a number of CISOs join us um, and. Uh, which we were very happy for have the, to have them join, but we spent some time talking to them and, and saying, why have you joined? And they basically said, well, at the minute, we can't find anywhere else that we really want to be. You know, there's no other CISO group that we want to be. So we thought we'd give you a try. Um, and we said, okay, and like, what would you want out of a CISO group then? And so they started to tell us and, you know, the things, some of the things that they want, um, which has been a common theme actually across all of our working groups, is that they want a safe space to communicate, right? Uh, they want to be able to talk under, uh, I don't know if everybody knows what I mean, but Chatham House rules, uh, which basically means, you know, what, what gets said in the room stays in the room. Uh, so, and they want support. And, you know, I mean, that could be all sorts of support. Um, we were hearing a story the other day, Lisa and I, you know, of um, one CISO literally going to help another CISO uh, by, you know, like going to sit with him in his in his office, inverted commas, you know, and, and literally uh, two CISO heads working on a problem, you know. So uh, it, it, there could be, um, a, you know, a lot of help, of different types of help that they they need you know if they've been attacked they're probably suffering from ptsd if i don't know if that sounds a bit mad but they probably are you know suffering from ptsd so they probably need some you know counseling about that so it's a heck of a it's a heck of a job at the minute and we are uh, well on the way now actually to providing a global ciso group um, there's probably about 50 or 15 or 20 uh, to start that group, if you like, already, um, which just to say something that, that I wanted to say is that you know, the thing at the minute that we have to do, and in fairness, the CRCs were an example of this, right, is, you know, we have to start communicating on a global basis. Uh, sorry, CRCs? Know, Cyber Resilience Centres, sorry, yeah, the, the, the Cyber Resilience Centres that we talked about rolling out, yeah. Um, you know, they were, they were the, the Cyber Resilience Centres were set up one in each police region in the UK to coordinate with themselves and with GCHQ, NCSC, etc. right, in order to actually track down the cyber criminals, right? Now that, you know, that was a, a national initiative or is a national initiative, right? That's great, but we need global initiatives and we need to communicate globally, right? And Lisa also mentioned the legal group. The biggest problem or a, a really big problem at the minute is, you know, we may be able to find these people and track them down but it, can we get them in court? And if we get them in court, can we get them prosecuted? And if we get them prosecuted, can we put them in jail? All of those are big questions, right? Not not easy. You know, there, there are a lot of cases that cannot be brought because they don't have sufficient evidence. Yeah, I, I would imagine that somebody who is capable of perpetrating a sophisticated attack would take great cares to hide their tracks, which yeah. can be done. It's totally possible if you're sophisticated enough to not leave a digital fingerprint. Although it's, I think, probably harder than most people would, would assume. So um, uh, about your organization then, um, 
uh, how how many people are involved uh, from like the you know operations and staff and all of that? Well, how big's the the actual company? We are run by an advisory board. Um, Chris and I are the uh, two main ones at the moment, but we're um, just recruiting um, for four other positions. So we're um, looking for somebody to help with marketing, um, coordination with all our partners, um, to help with um, events and uh, a bit more on the operational um, side. And we have a membership and um, administration uh, manager that deals with um, all that side of things when members um, want to, to, to come in. Um, so we're, we're already growing quite quickly and have that need to get um, those different departments um, together. Um, and also Chris does a lot in terms of the networking and the business development, um, prospecting and um, talking to members once they've um, joined. We hold an onboarding call with, uh, call with every one of them to say, you know, how can we help and support you and make sure you get the most um, out of the membership. Um, and the analogy that I always um, like to, to give actually, um, funnily enough, goes back to my ex-husband because I started out in cybersecurity from the entertainment industry uh, back in 2009 when I joined his software um, development company. And even back then, when we joined um, some of our local entities like the Chamber of Commerce um, and, um, and the Federation of Small Businesses and other entities um, in our area as a young growing business, he would always say that um, we can't just expect to join and then that's and then that's it and not interact with them and not um, you know get as, as much as, as, we, as we can from them. And it's a, it's a two way street. So um, rather than we've just joined and paid our membership fee, um, what we want to do is apply the same um, to the UK Cybersecurity Association. So um, we hold regular calls with our members. We, ha we have quarterly member briefing meetings where we'll feed back on all the work that we're doing, all that awareness raising stuff about the CISO group, the legal group, all of all of that, and really take their input and their feedback and shape this to be their association that we're for our members. Um, so that's that's something that's really important to me. Okay, and um, how do you how do you amass the the um, the expertise? Um, obviously, you're both experts yourselves, but uh, in computers, two experts are just a small number of experts because the topic yeah. is so vast, right? And I just know that from you know my branch of software development that you know two people don't know everything. That's simply it. So how do you how do you how, how do you tap into the um, needed level of expertise to, to, to address and educate so yeah. many different types of attacks, so many different types yeah. of stakeholders? And that's exactly where our advisory board um, comes in. So they're based all over the world uh, with different areas of expertise. So, for example, Professor Lisa Short um, is, um, is, is expert in um, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, and, and those different areas. Uh, we have um, Simon Newham that heads up the Police Digital Security Centre um, and he's got a good all-round knowledge of all the, uh, the, the different threat landscapes. Um, that, that's how we, 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 we've shaped our, our, our development. So our advisory board of, of, of 8 to 12 um, experts from uh, all over the world, is, you know, from our, even Australia, the States, um, from uh, from Canada, et cetera. And we all come to, together once a, a month to uh, to shape the development of the association. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything in, in, in there. Um, well, I, you know, it's very interesting, actually, I th and I know Lisa would agree with me here, is that, you know, we have added to our advisory board very carefully, right, because mm -hmm. Lisa, Lisa and I don't trust people easily actually <laughs> either of us right um so you know we tend we tend to do things carefully um but you know it has to be said that the right people seem to appear at the right time so far don't they lisa you know yeah. that that's true of our advisory board and it's true of you know it, just today we had an instance of somebody contacting us you know that had become available and that and Lisa and I both said, well, wow, that was great timing, <laughs> wasn't it? You know, so, yeah, we are, you know, we, um, you know, we're, we're not having any trouble. It's, it's interesting, actually, Robert, you say it because just today I was thinking, and I haven't even said this to Lisa, right, but I was thinking that, you know, we ought to have probably a couple more people who are more technical cyber experts around, 
us, you know. Now, we know lots of them, right? But we haven't really just like, we haven't reached out to them at the minute. We've, you know, it's been more a like commercial and strategy exercise than it has been a technical exercise, you know. But um, I, I, I just can see that happening, you know, where we do need to get some more. Te- well, actually, I say that, you know, we just had um, we just had Pete Rosinski join our advisory board. Um, as our te- as our first technical advisor. Now I think about it, didn't mm. we, Lisa? Yeah, yeah we, so. we did. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know who that is. Uh, no, no. <laughs> but if you look at it, if you go and look at the um, advisory board, right? Um, so, so Pete happens to be an ex Royal Navy weapons engineer officer like me, um, but he is he is also what's called a cyber essential certification body if you mm. if that means anything to you a cecb so basically what he w- he would is somebody that would go into an organization and he would assess that organization against the cyber essentials or cyber essentials plus standard right now you know there may be people on here that go cyber essentials you know that's like just a uk thing you know and you know but which is true <laughs> right but you know what i meant by that was i meant like i mean it could be nist in america for example you know that a business is assessed against some sort of standard that you know was originally put in place by gchq and ncsc yeah um and which you know that that standard they say they say properly implemented would probably stop 80% of the cyber attacks um unfortunately it doesn't get properly implemented <laughs> so so it doesn't stop 80 percent of the attacks right or sometimes it doesn't anyway so lisa with the remaining minutes that we have can mm-hmm. you tell me a little bit about um why you've got such a strong fo- focus on women and diversity yeah. and how you're a- approaching those topics Sure. Um, So I'm neurodiverse myself. I was diagnosed as autistic in 2018 um, after a lifetime of struggling with why I am the way I am and where I feel I don't fit in and need extra support, etc. I got a diagnosis and then it became um, clear that those that are neurodiverse tend to be quite well suited to careers in in cybersecurity. So that's um, a big focus for me is Um, trying to reach um, those that are neurodiverse um, to uh, mentor and help them um, into a career in the industry. Um, And by the same token, um, obviously, it's a very male dominated industry. So um, supporting women um, into careers in cyber is also very close um, to my to my heart. Um, And also reaching women that may be in completely different careers now, like like I was, but maybe want to transition into the industry but they aren't sure how to go about it, or even if um, some of their skills, they, they might think, well, I'm not technical enough, or um, I don't have you know, that certification, or I can't do you know, this particular thing. Um, and it's it's so you know vast and, and so broad. And again, another analogy I like to use is, you might want to be a, you know, a, a doctor. Well, that encompasses a whole different range of, of things. You might decide to be a general practitioner or an optician or um, go into, you know, into orthopedics or you know, it, it, it will be a heart surgeon. It's, it's vast. And the same is true of, of cybersecurity. There are so many different you know, technical and non-technical um, areas and roles that, that, that people can take. Um, so that's uh, something that's, that's, that's very much close to my heart. And what I enjoy doing is... Um, coaching those people and mentoring them in, into careers and, and and really inspiring them to think you may be, you know, a chef. So, for example, um, this is actually a, a guy which came from one of our, our cyber books, but there was a, a, a guy that actually transitioned from being a, a chef into cybersecurity. I was in the entertainment industry for many years, working with Chris Tarrant of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire fame in the UK before I um, transitioned to cyber in, in 2009. So it's those um, stories that I'm hoping to try and you know get out there and raise some awareness to people to say, you don't have to be technical. Um, you know, cybersecurity is something you can get into. Great. And um, mm-hmm. is that something that's resonating well? Are those working groups really well populated? Yeah. 
Definitely. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to come in on, on the working groups, but um, we, we certainly got a lot of uh, support for, for those and what we're doing. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, we we had, uh, I think it was, was it last week or the week before, mm. you know, we had the we had the first meetings of the working groups. Um, they were all very well attended. They were all very lively debates, <laughs> if you like. Um, there were there were there, there were a couple of common themes. One of those common themes was that everybody wanted a safe space uh, to communicate. You know, in particular. Um, women, you know, wanted probably their own safe space, if you like, to communicate. Not that they wanted to be forever isolated with men, but, you know, if they wanted to have a discussion about, you know, getting women into cybersecurity, then they wanted to have, to have a discussion with other women, <laughs> which is fair enough, isn't it, you know? <laughs> so, so, and, um, uh, so, you know, so that, that definitely uh, was a common theme. The military... The military working group, you know, I'm really, really proud of as well. Um, and, you know, we're going to start reaching into the military very early on, i.e. Uh, in terms of like, you know, when they first know that they're going to leave the military, we want to be in touch with them and say, OK, so let me tell you about this option, right, that you become you know, that you do something in the cyber security space. Um, equally, Lisa and I, next over the next two weeks, are presenting to young people, sixth formers, even earlier than that, right, talking to them about cyber security because the earlier that we can catch our young people, the better, basically. Great. Makes sense. Well, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. Did we miss anything that you wanted to add right now? Uh, there was one quick thing which I was just going to say to you, right, which is which is quite interesting at the minute, that it looks like the cyber insurance companies are going to stop cyber insuring people, right? Or they're going to do something else, if you like, which is quite an interesting turn of events, right? So Sounds like they're uh, getting up, like it's too risky for them to insure against. Exactly. It's too risky for them to insure against, right? So obviously they're going to hedge their bets here and try and reduce their risk uh, in a number of different ways. There's all sorts of ways being talked about. Yes, they'll increase the premium. Um, maybe they'll only cover 50% of the attack. Uh, they may even, they, they may insist uh, that companies have certain cybersecurity controls in place. You know, there it, it's, you know, it's very much a work in progress, but I just think it was worth saying that, right? Because I think that is going to have a dramatic effect on what happens around the world. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you, Chris, so much for the lively discussion. Uh, as I always do when I have great guests on the show, I learned a lot. I uh, hope the people watching and who will watch the recordings in the future also uh, do. Um, I would encourage everybody out there to come back next Friday for another episode of Deploy Friday. Um, enjoy your weekend, and thanks for watching. Thanks for being here as well. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.